Uh, want to welcome everyone this evening. If, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jason Andrews, uh, the superintendent here. Pleased to uh, welcome you to our third of our uh, parent forums. Uh, appreciate all of the, the parents who have uh, signed in as well as uh, many staff members as well. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen and, and we'll get started and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, our, the format we'll use this evening. So tonight we are uh, obviously doing this via Zoom webinar. So just a little bit about that. So uh, we have uh, with us uh, our leadership team and I will introduce them as well as Rachel Hamlin from uh, the Broome County Department of Health uh, that'll be joining us. And uh, what we will do, I'll just uh, go through uh, the, the panelists, uh, just uh, introduce everyone very quickly, really go in a, a fairly detailed overview of our plan uh, and uh, try to answer questions that you might have throughout the course of the plan. And then uh, really at the end, we will try to respond to any questions that have not been addressed uh, through the question and answer feature uh, at the bottom of your screen. So i uh, ask you to, to put those in. I know some folks have already done, tried the raise your hand feature, so that for us in this format won't work. Uh, so if you can uh, use that Q&A feature and uh, we'll be trying to answer questions as we go along in the, the Q&A and then of course uh, address them at the end. So uh, as I said, I uh, just want to introduce uh, the people that we have uh, here joining us tonight. So uh, we have uh, with us, and you'll hear from very soon, Scott Beatty, our Assistant Superintendent for Instruction. We have Andy Fiorentino, our Assistant Superintendent for Business. In addition, uh, we have uh, Barbara Phillips, who is the Director of Learning and Continuous Improvement. Dr. Jason Hands is our uh, Director of uh, Student Support and Family Services. Again, you'll be hearing from him regarding special education and our English language learner services in our reopening plan. We have uh, Barbara Tasber, who is uh, from Broome Tagabosis and works in uh, coordinating our technology and data. We have our uh, Director of Phys Ed, Athletics and Operations, Chris Durden. And we have our building level administrators uh, from the high school principal, Jeff Selasny, Associate Principal, Chris Klump, Middle School Principal, Kevin Straley, and our three elementary school principals from Weeks Elementary, Kristen Barriman, from Bell Elementary, Lori Holbert, and from Palmer Elementary, Toby Youngs. So it's our hope that we can uh, answer many of the questions that, that you might uh, have regarding our plan. So first, we really wanna start uh, with thanking you, uh, thanking you uh, for uh, not only your support in March, oh, and I mentioned, sorry, the other panelists that I mentioned before from the Broome County Department of Health, uh, Rachel Hamlin is right in the center of my screen, but I, I forgot to introduce her. So uh, we'll hear from, from Rachel a little later too. Uh, so when we made this shift uh, really in uh, with about 48 hours notice uh, to a fully remote setting, uh, you know, frankly, no one was particularly prepared for uh, what we were about to experience together over the next several months. And uh, the level of support that we received from families uh, from our uh, talented staff, uh, just trying to make things work. And uh, just the community coming together uh, was uh, just uh, just incredible. Uh, over that course of, of uh, the shift to remote, we still managed uh, to serve uh, almost 140,000 meals, uh, distributed those Chromebooks, uh, distributed Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, worked with companies to try to get broadband access for people, tried to uh, work with those families uh, that don't have internet access, uh, really, again, uh, saw everyone rally around uh, trying to do what's right for kids and to advance their learning. And so couldn't be more proud uh, to be part of, of this community and continue uh, with the honor of serving in the district. And then, you know, as uh, for the past several months, we've been working on, okay, so how do we get to a, a safe and successful reopening? And so I wanna thank the uh, dozens of parents. Uh, we had uh, over 100 people involved in our committees for our reopening plan, over 800 
uh, people involved in our uh, responding to our thought exchange questions. I want to thank everyone for taking the, in, in some cases, many phone calls uh, as we've tried to uh, really student by student, family by family assess uh, not only where we are, but what we can do to, to support people. And then uh, just the, the many people that continue to reach out with, with questions, with comments, uh, with suggestions, and uh, we really appreciate that and uh, appreciate everyone's patience. So uh, there are Although there are a lot of rule books that are currently being uh, given to us, uh, a lot of regulations, uh, there's not really a playbook. Uh, we're really uh, trying to build something uh, that we've not done before, uh, trying to, to do something uh, that, you know, frankly, we can't look at our just our previous experiences and say, this is what we did during the last pandemic. So. Uh, we appreciate the the patience that people uh, continue to have uh, both within the staff and of course within the community so we were tasked uh, by new york state with uh, formulating three plans uh, one for a fully in-person uh, learning environment one for a hybrid environment where uh, some of the learning was taking place uh, in the the school buildings and other at home and then uh, finally, a, a completely remote uh, in, instructional environment. For us, the reality is uh, we were really only able to uh, build two plans in that what we found with the uh, regulations, the requirements, and the guidance documents, uh, we were not able to uh, have a fully in-person pre-K through 12 setting and still fulfill those obligations. So that uh, really was uh, the, the first challenge was we weren't able to do that. And uh, on our website, you'll find all sorts of resources, but one of those uh, resources is the 147 page guidance document from the New York State Education Department. So uh, the requirements are, are pretty prescriptive. Uh, there's not a whole lot of discretion in a number of areas. So we, we could not make that happen uh, within our physical setting. So our plans, are really uh, two, and one is uh, this hybrid, uh, some students in school uh, and others uh, remote, and then we have the option, uh, should we uh, be either forced to go or determined to go to an all remote setting uh, as we move forward. So when we uh, look at this, uh, the, the basic tenets that this plan is built on is really the health and safety of our students and staff. And although, of course, that would make great sense uh, within a pandemic, it would make great sense uh, while we're in the, the middle of this situation, this really is not something new for us. So uh, in our strategic plan for the past 15 years, uh, we have built that number one priority being the, the safety and well-being of our, our staff and students. And so uh, it's with that that we uh, really build this plan. And so, as I share uh, the details, you know, this will include the daily screenings, our increased disinfection and cleaning, and then uh, just managing uh, anyone that uh, may become ill. So there are really three practices that are emphasized uh, with the health and safety component throughout the plan. So first is social distancing, and that is uh, either six foot or with barriers in place. The wearing of personal protective equipment, and then finally, uh, the, the personal hygiene aspects uh, as, as really giving an increased intent, attention, uh, doing uh, increased training uh, for students and staff and so on. So I'll dig into each of those things. So uh, at all times, whenever it is practicable, we want to be able to maintain six feet of separation uh, between uh, all of the individuals in the building. So in order to do that, uh, of course, we've had to look at space very differently, look at classroom configurations differently, et cetera. Whenever uh, we cannot maintain that social distancing, so we can't uh, maintain uh, six foot of uh, distance or have barriers in place, then that personal protective equipment masks must be worn. In addition, uh, we are uh, having changes to our traffic flow patterns in our hallways. Uh, so that uh, we, we have avoid intermingling of, of individuals, both students and staff. So 
Uh, for example, on one side of a hallway, it may be you know, going in one direction only. Another side of the hallway would go in the opposite direction. Stairways up or down only. And to avoid uh, student congregation uh, in the middle and high schools, uh, we will not be using student lockers. So wherever we can uh, make adjustments uh, to our, uh, our facilities, we're really doing so that, so that we can maximize that uh, social distancing. In addition to that, again, whenever uh, social distancing cannot be maintained, then masks will be worn. So the district has already purchased cloth masks for all of our staff members. Uh, we also have a supply of masks, of disposable uh, surgical masks for our students. Students, of course, are encouraged to bring them from home. Uh, they'll need them to board our bus, to enter our buildings. Uh, but uh, if they don't bring them from home, we will uh, provide them with a mask. And then uh, when there are periods of instruction, so when instruction is occurring and social distancing is in place, again, either that six feet uh, or barriers, then there will be the opportunity for a break from wearing the mask. So that uh, will be during periods of instruction. So at the middle and high school, a regular class period. So roughly 35 minutes, uh, they'll vary just a little bit. And then at the elementary level in those, uh, each 30 minute block of instruction, there will be a minimum of a five minute break uh, from wearing their masks. And in addition uh, to that, and I'll talk a little, uh, quite a little bit more about masks as we move forward, our nurses also uh, have uh, significant personal protective equipment N95 respirators, uh, gowns, et cetera, uh, that they are being provided with. So one of the questions, uh, probably the biggest question, the question I get over and over and over, uh, wherever I am is about, so when do kids have to wear their masks? And uh, you know, I, I try to be uh, as concise and clear with it as I can. Uh, frankly, uh, I've used the same slides. I've tried to give the same explanation and, and folks uh, are still a bit confused. So I really wanna uh, try to be as clear as I can be. So students must wear a mask whenever they're not socially distanced. So that is non-discretionary. So when they're walking down the halls, they have to have the mask. When they're up and about in a classroom, they have to be wearing their mask. If they're going to the restroom, they need to, to be wearing their mask. If they're at bus stops, they need to be wearing their mask. The entire time they're on a school bus, they need to have their mask on. When they don't wear a mask, so when will, when will they be able to take them off, is really at the direction of a teacher during periods of instruction, as I mentioned, so 30 minutes, every 30 minutes uh, at the elementary level, in those class periods at the secondary level, they'll have a minimum of a five minute break from wearing their mask. Again, whenever social distancing is, is broken, then they'll have to have their masks on. So, and that really, again, uh, it's non-discretionary. We don't have the ability to say, well, uh, we don't like that rule. Uh, we're more comfortable or less comfortable. Uh, both mask breaks and the wearing of masks are mandatory in the uh, guidance documents, both from the New York State Department of Education and the Department of Health. In addition to uh, the mask breaks, then students also won't wear masks, of course, when they're eating. So during their breakfast, during their lunch, we'll have social distancing in place, uh, and they'll, of course, have their masks off during that time. Um, masks will need to cover their nose and mouth, so that will be important. And again, as I mentioned, uh, if the, the mask is ill-fitting or they forget their mask, then the district has a supply of masks that will provide for them. So then what, what happens if a student refuses to wear their mask? Now, uh, you know, I, I really uh, anticipate that in most cases, uh, students will absolutely be compliant. They may need to be reminded. Uh, certainly we will do that. But if we have someone that is uh, simply uh, defiant, refusing to wear that mask, uh, what would happen is they would be subject to our disciplinary code. So if it was a repeated offense, so our, our intent is uh, to assist them, to help them, to help them understand the importance. But if they were 
uh, simply being insubordinate to that rule, then we would apply the code of conduct. Ultimately, it could uh, result in a suspension in which they would have to be in a remote setting. So again, our hope is that that's not going to, to be problematic, uh, but that uh, will, will be what happens as we move forward. At the same time, however, there may be students who have a medical reason uh, for not wearing a mask, so an exemption. So students may qualify for an exemption, but that exemption must come from a healthcare provider. So either a physician, a mental health care provider, et cetera. So uh, what cannot happen uh, is a parent sending a note saying, my, my child is uncomfortable, uh, my, uh, I don't want them to wear a mask. This is a, a medical exemption. And so uh, that uh, physician's note would come to us. We would have that reviewed by our school physicians and then that determination for eligibility for the exemption would take place at that time. What I would ask if uh, parents do believe that there is a, a need for an exemption, that they give us a, as much advance notice as possible. It will be problematic for us if uh, they arrive at school with that exemption that first day and uh, trying to uh, accommodate those, uh, those exemptions. So uh, that again is a medical uh, uh, exemption, not a preference uh, piece. One of the things that we'll be doing uh, is training all of our staff and all of our students uh, on proper hygiene practices, uh, respiratory hygiene, as well as hand washing, uh, hand sanitizing, et cetera. There will be hand sanitizing stations uh, throughout the district in classrooms, in common areas, in cafeterias, et cetera. Uh, one of the real key pieces of, again, uh, that is not news to anyone, but that uh, frequent hand washing, avoiding touching uh, the face, uh, doing all of those uh, hygiene practices is a, a critical uh, mitigating factor that we can have in, in the spread. In addition to that, uh, on a daily basis, all employees and uh, will we'll complete an online illness screener, so that, uh, that COVID screener, uh, where we have an, uh, an app that we're uh, working to uh, procure for uh, both staff and students. Families will be uh, really critical partners with this and uh, can't emphasize how important it will be for families uh, to screen their students before they ever get to the bus or get to school. Uh, again, there's a, a checklist of uh, checking their temperature, checking for those, uh, those COVID symptoms, and we'll be asking uh, for uh, an assurance uh, from families. Again, we're working on an, an app for the reporting of that as well. However, uh, when all students and staff arrive, then we will be doing temperature checks. So at, uh, at the main entrances, we've purchased uh, temperature scanning stations. Uh, so they will uh, be arriving and then we have uh, many handheld uh, stations as well. The standard is anyone with a temperature above 100 degrees then uh, cannot stay in the building. So uh, each building uh, ha will have an isolation room uh, for anyone that is experiencing any COVID-like symptoms and so on, and they would have to uh, leave for further screening from uh, medical professionals. And so uh, that, uh, again, that health screening piece will be really important uh, that we have uh, the partnership of parents as we uh, try to make sure that uh, students are, uh, are healthy prior to their arrival. In addition, uh, our facilities, uh, really three areas of focus uh, in our plan. The first is, is those uh, classroom supplies and not uh, from the school supply standpoint, but from the, uh, the safety standpoint, health and safety standpoint, uh, thinking about hand sanitizer, cleaning products, et cetera. Uh, our protocols for uh, frequently touched areas and our cleaning protocols. So uh, each uh, classroom is uh, being equipped with disinfectant wipes, hand sanitizing stations, and uh, replacement masks uh, should a student or staff member uh, need them. So we have been uh, busily attaining uh, that personal protective equipment, sanitizing equipment, uh, cleaning uh, supplies, uh, which has been uh, rather challenging this summer. In addition to that, uh, throughout the course of the day, uh, 
frequent touch areas, desks, door handles, uh, et cetera, uh, have been identified as areas for ongoing cleaning. So uh, working through uh, the, the planning uh, for uh, placing, putting those protocols in place for that frequent cleaning uh, throughout the course of the day. In addition to uh, our daily cleanings and the, the multiple times uh, through the day in our high touch areas and our hallways and bathrooms, on a nightly basis, uh, we have purchased uh, disinfecting uh, uh, misters, misting equipment uh, that we will be use, utilizing in classrooms, on playgrounds, in buses, et cetera. And uh, we've already been using that equipment for, for some time. And, uh, and are having uh, good success with that. We can clean, uh, we can disinfect uh, large areas in a, a really short amount of time. And so we'll be utilizing those disinfecting misters uh, on a daily basis. One of the questions is regarding our air quality. So for the past several months, we've been working with our uh, architects and engineers uh, regarding air quality. And uh, they have been reviewing our facilities and uh, we have been assured that our systems meet or exceed uh, any New York State standards. In addition uh, to that, of course, we complete our uh, building condition survey. Uh, we do our uh, annual uh, visual inspections are completed by outside professionals and filed with, with New York State uh, Education Department Facilities Office. We will also though be taking steps to increase airflow whenever possible. Opening windows, opening doors, uh, interior doors, uh, opening windows and hatches on buses uh, anytime it's over 45 degrees. So uh, one of the things that uh, is, is part of our plan is to uh, increase into uh, the air wherever we can. In addition, uh, over the, the past couple of months and this summer, uh, we have replaced all of the filters in all of our uh, unit ventilators uh, through across the district. And so uh, we, we believe we've been uh, proactive in this area as well. Another critical component of our plan is, our, uh, is providing child uh, nutrition. So I mentioned uh, that, of course, has been a priority of, us, of ours is to, to provide uh, nutrition to our students. So we'll be really doing it, uh, of course, for our students uh, that are in school. We'll be uh, providing uh, the opportunity for uh, nutrition for students in our hybrid model that are in school some days, not in school other days, and also the opportunity for students who are learning remotely. So our, our breakfast uh, will look much like it did uh, previously, so at the elementary level. Uh, students will have their, uh, their breakfast uh, in the classrooms, again, uh, maintaining uh, social distancing uh, while they're eating. Uh, middle and high school students will be on a grab and go system uh, that they'll get upon their arrival. And then in our, uh, in our lunch times, so lunches will uh, work much the same in that we will use our kitchens, uh, but we'll be employing again those social distancing practices uh, throughout, you know, going through the lines, et cetera. Uh, and then we'll use our dining rooms uh, for students uh, to eat. We, we believe uh, with the numbers uh, of our of students uh, who have elected to go fully remote uh, that we can accommodate uh, in our dining rooms uh, with students in a, in a socially distanced way to, to eat. There may be times uh, that uh, we have some overflow. So for example, uh, we, you know, are expanding the footprint of that high school uh, cafeteria a bit uh, than, than we normally do. Uh, we will be asking students uh, to, to be seated by cohort. In other words, they're going to sit with the same students uh, uh, every day. Uh, and you'll also likely see uh, some differences in the time. So we're going to have a slightly different lunch uh, serving schedule in order to accommodate those uh, things. If uh, we cannot uh, accommodate the social distancing within the dining rooms, then we've identified you know, those overflow spaces uh, where, where students can go for their consumption. So one of the questions that I get often is, will students have to eat their lunch in the classroom? And the answer is no, not at this time. Then those students who are in the fully remote setting, uh, we will have breakfast and lunch available for pickup in, in each of the buildings. 
Uh, in addition to that, for those families that uh, have no means to come get it, then we will uh, work on a delivery schedule. What I will say, however, is, you know, we did a lot of delivery in the spring. In fact, the majority of those almost 140,000 meals uh, were delivered to people's homes. In some cases, that was a matter of they had no means to get to the school to get it. In some cases, uh, frankly, it was just more convenient for them. And, and it worked out well for us because we also had uh, bus drivers who were uh, being paid, who were uh, eager to, to work and to help in any way they could. They're now going to be transporting students at those times. So it's going to be much more challenging for us uh, to do uh, all of that food delivery. So uh, certainly, again, we wanna feed our kids. That's a priority for us. But again, we'll be asking for the help of our families uh, so that we can, can make this work. As you might guess, some of this is a, is a pretty heavy lift to try to make it, uh, make it work fully. Students who are in the hybrid setting, those students in grades six through 12, will have the opportunity to take meals with them, breakfast and lunch with them, when they are in school to consume on the day that they're in a remote setting. So if we're on, Mr. Beatty shortly will go through that, that A, B schedule, but if, I'm a, if today is an A day, I'm an A student, then I would take my breakfast and lunch home with me today that I would eat tomorrow while the B students, while I'm home on a remote learning and the B students are, are in place. So again, working through uh, that, uh, that distribution of those meals to those students at the end of the day. Transportation has been one of the, the most daunting challenges uh, of this in that, you know, I think one of the things uh, people ask me, why don't all the schools have the same plan? And uh, because not all the schools are organized in the same way, they may all be on one campus uh, versus us uh, who are on multiple campuses, and every district looks just a little bit different. So uh, Windsor is about 118 square miles, and we do double bus runs. In other words, we separate the elementary students from the secondary students. Not every district does that. So. Uh, when we start looking at the requirements for transportation and buses, I started to talk a little bit about them, but this is a, a big challenge. So in order to have social distancing on the buses, then we are going from a 66 passenger bus, having that capacity, uh, having a reduction all the way down to 22 students. So what that means is, of course, uh, it's, a, it's a much uh, greater challenge to transport them. One of the things that we uh, did uh, on our website, the form is still there, is uh, had the opportunity for parents who said, you know, we would like to provide transportation ourselves. And so that is something that many families have taken advantage of. Not everybody has that, uh, the, the ability to do that, and we absolutely can provide transportation uh, to those who have not. So when we start looking at uh, that, uh, at our transportation piece, again, two critical areas. So part is the, the cleaning and disinfecting protocols and then that social distancing. So uh, all of our buses are going to be disinfected prior to uh, their, their runs uh, at the beginning of the day, in between runs and after. So uh, we again uh, will have our, our misting uh, machines uh, in the, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but we also will have uh, wipe downs, again, of those high touch surfaces as we go through. In addition, as I mentioned before, uh, in warmer weather, 45 degrees or above, we'll have uh, windows and the roof hatches open. Now, one of the things that's important to note uh, is uh, regarding hand sanitizer. So I mentioned we have hand sanitizing stations throughout the buildings, including the transportation building. However, uh, the district cannot equip any of our buses with hand sanitizing stations, nor can uh, any of our, our bus drivers, bus aides, or any monitors have a personal supply of hand sanitizer. That's prohibited. However, the guidance does not prohibit students from having their own personal hand sanitizer in, in, their, uh, you know, in their bags, uh, on their person, et cetera. So, uh, the district cannot equip buses with hand sanitizer. Our staff won't have hand sanitizer, but your children can bring their own hand sanitizer with them 
uh, should they choose to do so. Again, uh, on those buses, uh, that social distancing, so students will be one to a seat. Uh, unless they have a member of their household, then they could have a second person in that seat with them. They'll be in assigned seats uh, in, in pre-K through 12, and will be loading the bus from the back to the front. In other words, if you're the first stop, you're in the back seat. Not like when I was in school when you know the oldest, the biggest, the toughest, or whatever would get the back seat, now it's going to be the first one on the bus. So uh, those will be assigned seats, uh, and, and then we will uh, unload, of course, from the front to the back. So any uh, limiting of exposure that, that we can, uh, then we are doing that, of course. What it will mean, though, is uh, we're, we believe at the secondary level, based on the number of people who have opted out of transportation, who have opted for a fully remote uh, learning, and the fact that we will be on that A-B schedule 50% uh, decrease, we're able to still do that secondary run in one run. At the elementary level, however, uh, we need to do two bus runs, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that schedule will look like in, in just a few minutes. Again, as I mentioned before, uh, masks uh, will be worn by, by our staff on the buses, as well as all students uh, who uh, do not have a medical exemption from that. Of course, one of our main uh, concerns is also the social and emotional well-being of our students. And that uh, remained a concern, of course, in the, the shift to remote learning. Uh, the, the mental health of our students uh, is, is critically important and, and just uh, maintaining family well-being. And so uh, we also have a uh, in our plan uh, work to address that, to provide support for students, for families, and again, to, to uh, continue to facilitate the, the relationships and the partnerships that we have with families. So we have a district advisory council. We're fortunate in our district that each building has certified school counselors. So uh, it's somewhat unique to have a certified school counselor at, at, in every elementary building. So we're glad uh, that we have those resources. So they, along with our school psychologists, our social worker, and other uh, partners, our community school coordinator, et cetera, uh, are, have been working uh, through the summer to update our counseling plans and to uh, make plans for uh, the training of staff, the training of students, and, and really uh, checking in with them. So we'll be doing surveys. There's a survey that will be coming out to all parents uh, very, very soon uh, from that uh, District Advisory Council on Social and Emotional Wellbeing. Uh, we will, again, be making referrals with so many of our outside uh, partners. We'll be working on some videos on what to expect so that as, uh, as students and, frankly, families are experiencing anxiety about what's it going to look like, uh, that we can start to ease some of that anxiety. We will be uh, continuing with some of our parent support groups and then uh, really working with uh, staff and students on uh, developing uh, coping skills uh, as we uh, recognize that this has been a, a traumatic uh, time for so many uh, families. So then uh, really that we start to move into, so what does it look like from the scheduling standpoint? So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Mr. Beatty, and I think I was able to give him the ability to share his screen. Let's see, Mr. B, I've just changed it. You're the host now. So you should be able to share your screen and you're muted. Working on a couple clicks here, excuse me. Screen three, all right. I think we're there. Can you see school schedules? Is that there? Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Andrews. Again, my name is Scott Beatty, Assistant Superintendent for Instruction. I've been with the district for over 15 years now. Uh, first as uh, Associate Middle School Principal, Middle School Principal, and now here at the district office. I'm also fortunate enough to have uh, four kids enrolled in the district who are looking to return in the fall as well. Uh, so I'm right there with you in terms of 
questions, answers, and, and, and making sure that we have the best program possible for, for, for all of us. So uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about school schedules, uh, some of your options in terms of remote instruction and in-person instruction. I'll share a little bit about technology and communication as we move forward. Well, let me see if I got it going, here we go. All right, so looking at the elementary level, PK through five, uh, one option is in-person instruction. So our intent is uh, to provide in-person instruction five days a week for those students who wish to return. Up on the screen there, you see the totals thus far in terms of families or numbers of kids who will be opting for remote instruction instead. So looking across the district, PK through 12, there's 260 kids at this point who are choosing remote instruction. And that's out of roughly 1,600 kids across the district. So as you take a moment and soak in those numbers, there's 55 going remotely at uh, Weeks Elementary, 37 at Palmer, 51 at Bell. And then when you look at the middle school and high school, 57 and 60 respectively. So that keep those numbers in mind when we move on to talk a little bit about the secondary environment and that AB schedule. Uh, families do have the option for full remote learning. Uh, when we look at the elementary plan, what is different compared to the high school is that we're gonna dedicate teachers to remote learning only. So at this point, there's about six teachers that have been designated to take on that remote learning uh, responsibility. So it'll be separate from the classroom teacher. Their focus will be the remote learning kids. However, the remote learning instructor will be in constant communication and collaboration with the classroom teacher in order to ensure that we have an equitable curriculum across all grade levels and experiences. Uh, remote learning plans essentially are gonna need to be developed on a student by student or family by family need basis. Each family uh, has some different reasons for for choosing remote and also different circumstances. So for example, uh, based off of a phone call I had with a parent uh, last week, their child will be in daycare while traditional school is ongoing. So some of that remote interaction with the teacher via Zoom will occur after school, after traditional school. So those will be developed uh, as we get closer to the start of school. Uh, as Dr. Andrews said, there, there is a link on our website if that is an option you're looking to do to choose remote. We ask that you go and complete, the, complete that, uh, that form that you can find on our website. Arrival and departure times for in-person instruction will be staggered based on the transportation needs. So there's gonna be two elementary bus runs and what you see there in front of you are the estimated arrival times or drop-off times for each of those runs. So the first run being arrival to school around 8.45 and departing at 2.30. And then the second run, arrival at 9.45 and departing at 3.30. So there'll be about an hour of time where half the elementary population is in session, which will allow our teachers opportunity to provide inter intervention or enrichment in a, in a much smaller group setting. And the same thing will occur on, on the back end of the day as that first run of students leave. The second run of students will have that more individualized attention as well. So there are, there are some actually advantages to this two-run system, believe it or not. And Mr. Beatty, if I can just interrupt you for a second, looking at some of the, the questions and answers, for parent drop-offs at the elementary level, so this is elementary only, we'll get to secondary in just a moment. Parent drop-offs, you would drop them off as normal, 845 and pick up at 330. Again, you roughly, you'll get uh, correspondence from uh, the principal, so pick up and drop off may look a little bit different than they have before, but uh, they won't be on, on that shortened piece. So if you're a drop off, uh, you would do that as, as normal in terms of the normal schedule. Again, uh, making some variations as we, again, have to uh, have our protocols for temperature checks, et cetera, and we're trying to promote as much social distancing as possible. So that's uh, something in the chat. When will they know uh, when that uh, will be? So I can tell you that's evolving every day. So part of it, every time someone makes a decision that they're either going to attend or not attend, or they're going to use transportation or not transportation, that impacts the runs. I will tell you the transportation department is working very hard on this all day, every day, and you can expect to know that schedule very soon. And by department, he means Terry Butts. So if you have a chance to talk to, to, to uh, Terry, 
certainly extend your best wishes because she's doing an outstanding job for us. You too, Mr. Durden. <laughs> Moving on, looking at the high school level or the secondary level, six through 12, 50% student body comes into play here in order to be able to achieve that social distancing that we need in the classrooms and also in the hallways. So looking at the, the head count statistics, so sixth through eighth grade student bodies, roughly 350 kids. So we're talking 175 kids in the building, more or less, on a daily basis. Looking at the high school, you're looking at 255 kids. It's an important number to keep in mind uh, when you think about our school, uh, our secondary school experience compared to some of the things that you're seeing on the news, uh, in particular, I reflect on the, the, the video or the footage coming out of Georgia, that Georgia high school where kids were jammed into the hallway. Uh, when you're looking at 50% capacity in, in our buildings, that experience isn't gonna occur. In addition, other measures are being put in place in terms of controlling hallway movement uh, by the principal and, the, and their teacher leadership committees uh, in, in terms of staggering student time in the hallway uh, and in terms to, to minimize and to maximize the ability to distance. So this idea of an A-B schedule, let me show you the graphic. I'll let you take, take a step back and soak this beauty in. So obviously 50% of kids every day divided into cohort A, cohort B. So if I'm cohort A on Monday in this scenario, I'm there for in-person instruction. On Tuesday, I stay home and I attend remotely. Now that remote experience the intent is for students to zoom in to their core classes on the remote day. In addition, there'll be some extension activities that they'll need to complete in preparation for returning to in-person instruction on Wednesday. And if you look at cohort B, it follows the opposite schedule. If you carry that out through the week and then get into the following week, essentially the schedule reverses. If I'm Monday, Wednesday, Friday in week one, I will be Tuesday, Thursday, week two. Again, the intent behind that every other day experiences is to have that equitable access to education and also try to mitigate the impact of holidays that, that are, are typically on Mondays and Fridays within the school calendar. Uh, for electives in the middle school and high school, on your remote day, you will not zoom into those classes. You can expect to have extension activities uh, available for you uh, uh, online in utilizing your Chromebook. Uh, as we'll talk about technology, every kid K through 12 will have access to a Chromebook. School, school schedule, uh, taking a look there, uh, because of the need to support the two elementary runs, uh, the secondary, both middle school and high school will be ending an hour early. So the time that you see on, the, on that graphic in front of you 745 at the middle school and 750 respectively that that essentially is 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 a is student entry time into the building uh knock some secondary teachers for a loop in our last webinar uh, in terms of the, the start day so that 745 you can picture kids entering into the building to begin their day uh with dismissal occurring at 115 and 130 at the middle school and high school level to get about the bus run in order to be able to accommodate the two runs at the elementary level. Families have the option to choose full remote at the secondary level as well. Uh, in, this, in this circumstance, the intent is for the classroom teacher to provide that remote instruction. Uh, kids who are on 100% remote would zoom into or participate via Zoom with their classroom teachers. They would follow that A-B schedule in terms of when do I need to tune into my cores and when do I need to tune into my electives. Uh, however, uh, it would be via Zoom, via the regular classroom teacher. Well, let's take a turn and take a look at all remote instruction. So unfortunately, obviously last spring we had to go all remote. Uh, in the event, if we do have to go all remote, uh, you can expect that, uh, obviously, it's similar to, to last spring, all materials are going to be provided. All kids would have their Chromebook in order to access it. At this point, secondary kids would follow their regular daily schedule. Elementary, there will be some scheduled courses as well. And then once full school, full in-school attendance is permitted, 
the hybrid model of instruction would end. So what constitutes this decision to go to, uh, go to remote? Well, when you look at the, the requirements that were put out by the state in order to reopen, well, for schools to reopen, the region itself, Southern Tier had to be in phase four in terms of the economics and getting ready back to school. The daily infection rate has to remain below 5% using a 14 day average. And then on the other end of that, for schools to close or to be declared closed, uh, the regional infection rate would have to rise above 9% using the seven day average. Taking some stats offered by uh, the state website, this was earlier in the week. If you zero in on the middle of the screen, looking at new infections, so percent positive tests per day on a seven day, seven day rolling average in the southern tier is at 0.4%. Again, this, these stats are about 48 hours old. Uh, new cases per 100,000 on a seven day rolling average, 1.74. So that's close to the current statin, status of our region. So in order for us to move to a full remote setting, that would be done in consultation and collaboration with the Board of Education, the Broome County Department of Health, and if it came down to it, the governor's decision to say all schools are closed. Technology and connectivity. So as I stated earlier, the district's gonna provide uh, Chromebooks again for all students K through 12. Pre-K students will be provided on an as-needed basis, uh, depending on, on how that program develops. Hotspots are available for families. So we were fortunate enough to be able to purchase T-Mobile hotspots last spring. So for families without internet, but in good cell service, we do have these hotspots available. If you happen to be one of those families, certainly communicate that with your building principal so we can have you set up with a hotspot. Uh, unfortunately, if you are without internet and without quality cell service, which is just the reality of the area that we live in, uh, last spring we used a flash drive system and our intent is to do the same. And what happens with that is classroom teachers save materials to the flash drive or thumb drive. It's either picked up by the family or delivered by our transportation department. Students can plug it into their Chromebook and then upload the materials in order to participate either watching a video watching video instruction or answering questions save back to the thumb drive re-deliver to the school so then the teacher can review the work and provide feedback additionally uh, the district has new outdoor access points uh, that will allow connectivity outside of our buildings so we've all we've had public wi-fi for a while now we have upgraded the exterior uh, components of our Wi-Fi system. So essentially the dome of coverage is much stronger and broader. Uh, last spring we did have families or students, especially at the high school level, who would head to the parking lot in order to access the internet. So that opportunity is available district-wide at all of our buildings. Looking at instruction, uh, obviously things will continue to be linked to New York State learning standards. We're, We've taken, uh, we've surveyed families and students directly to get feedback on their experience from, this, from the springtime. And I've learned some good lessons, uh, not only from our own experience, but from the experience of our kids and how we can improve. So looking ahead to the start of school, we have some professional development days lined up uh, to strengthen our ability to provide remote instruction. Uh, but also it's important that, that all students keep in mind that at this point, Regents exams are on. Uh, three through eight testing is on. So our, our preparation has to be in anticipation of being ready for those days as well. Um, and it, certainly our intent is to provide an equitable experience regardless of your decision, whether it be remote or in person or a little bit of both. Communication, that's the cornerstone of, of our success uh, in terms of uh, a community and, and a district. Uh, top priority, you know, at any time you have a need, don't hesitate to call the building principal, uh, hitting up their main office number and lines, which are available on our website, and all of our teachers are accessible via email. Uh, you're, you're encouraged to contact your building principal or guidance counselor at any time, either approaching the start of school or as school begins in order to set up a phone conference or a Zoom conference uh, to articulate your needs so we make sure that your needs are met. 
Uh, lastly, in terms of district-wide communication, you can continue to count on the use of School Messenger. That's that district-wide push out of emails and phone calls. The school website really is the most up-to-date information and uh, our, our, we, we, take, we take great pride in, in keeping that up-to-date so don't hesitate to look at the website. Right up at the top is information about reopening and count on some mailings uh, of all those being our primary means of communication. Lastly, one of the big things that came back from families uh, was uh, concern about the number of tech platforms that we were using. Uh, as a parent myself, trying to keep my kids organized, I found it difficult sometimes. So when you look at the two main platforms that you can expect to see within your kids' schooling this year, Seesaw is the platform uh, K through three uh, that will allow for the transfer of materials and videos and also communication between classroom teacher and parent. And in grades three through 12, Schoology, same deal. That's where they'll be able to go and find their assignments, post materials, and a basis for communication as well. So with that, I turn it back over to Dr. Andrews. Yeah, so just a, a couple of things. Thank you very much, Mr. Beatty. appreciate it. Um, just uh, some things from the chat. So how will BOCES work? Well, BOCES, um, I will tell you, this has been an extremely challenging time for us to try to figure out in one district. And Broom Tagaboses is trying to accommodate the needs of students from 15 districts, uh, many of which have uh, pretty different plans. And so uh, that has been challenging. In general, the way that it will work is that uh, if students are in person here, then they would be in person uh, at BOCES. If students are remote here, they would be remote at BOCES. So they're really matching our schedule. So students will still have their opportunities in career and technical education, et cetera. Some of our BOCES special education programs uh, at the site, et cetera, you know, their, their schedules, uh, you, you will be hearing from BOCES. They provide uh, those services. But uh, for the most part, those uh, special education programs will be uh, in person every day uh, at BOCES. The AB schedule, so one of the things that, uh, again, keeping in mind, so we are an AB schedule, not a Monday, Wednesday, or Mon Thursday, Friday. So in the case of a snow day, so how will snow days be handled? They'll be handled just like they have been always. So uh, this is my 16th year of doing snow day, so half of the people will think it's a good decision. Half of the people think it's a bad decision, so we'll still be at that part. But snow days will work just the way that, that uh, they have in that regard. And one of the reasons for the A-B schedule is that if today is Wednesday and it's a B day, but it was a snow day, then tomorrow, Thursday becomes the B day. If a holiday is on a Monday, then that week starts with a Tuesday, if a holiday's on a Friday. One of the things in looking at the, the school calendar, we wanted to equalize uh, the number of days of instruction in person uh, for those secondary students. So that's part of the rationale for the AB students. The whole premise of our plan is to maximize teacher and student interaction. The other thing uh, in terms of keeping in mind, so asking about, so will elementary students have recess? Yes. Will elementary students have specials? Yes. Well, what at the secondary level, if we're uh, dismissing an hour early to accommodate the transportation issues, what will they be losing? Well, they're going to be shortened periods. So they'll still have the same class schedule that they would have, the same, be enrolled in the same courses. They'll just be reduced by a few minutes in order to accommodate the transportation runs. So again, the part of the big premise of this plan is to ensure that students are not denied opportunities, that they're not denied course offerings, and that we maximize that contact between teachers and students. So with that, and we'll continue to uh, address questions as we go, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Hans, who will uh, discuss uh, special education and English language learners. All right, thank you, Dr. Andrews. My name is Jason Hans. I'm the Director of Special Programs at the Windsor Central School District, and I'm going to speak to you about the guidance that we have received from the state to address the needs of our special education students. 
So the main uh, objective that the state uh, set forth to us is to make sure that we follow IEPs as closely as we can in the environment that students find themselves in this year. So whether that is in-person learning with social distancing or if that is fully remote learning, we need to make sure that we are providing those services as best we can uh, in that given situation. And I'll explain to you how we're gonna do that. So each teacher will review their caseload and the current IEPs. They'll look at all the services and accommodations that students are to receive, and they will decide if it's something that we can implement as is, or if certain adjustments need to be made based on the student either being in a smaller group at school or something that's going to be happening at home that obviously wouldn't be able to be provided by the school district. So that will be completed, that plan will be completed in conjunction with the families. So uh, our plan is to have it be a collaborative process so that you have input into that and we can develop a plan that works for the students and their families. That may include some changes to accommodations, modifications, uh, special ed services, some of their technology needs that they have. We're going to have the same um, plan for our preschool students as well. And our off-campus students will also have that plan completed so that parents are very clear on what is going to be provided to their student and how it may look slightly different this year. In terms of our English language learners, the state has put forth three areas that they wanted us to focus on. The first one is really just to comply with the existing identification process. They've extended that slightly to start the year, um, but that will be no problem for us to be able to meet those guidelines. So that will look uh, just as normal as it always has. They are asking us to make sure that we are implementing the units of study, uh, which is also just a name for the program or the minutes that the students receive from their ESL teacher. And we'll be using the data from the 2018-19 uh, school year to determine what their mandated number of minutes are. Since there was no uh, state testing for 1920, we'll use the previous year's results. And then finally, uh, the third task is really just to communicate clearly again with these parents to make sure that they are aware of what is going to be happening with their child and what those services are going to look like. So our uh, English language learner teacher will be contacting each of those parents and again working out a plan that works best for everybody. And with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Anders. Great, thank you very much. Um, so in terms of uh, BOCES transportation, so BOCES transportation uh, will work much like it always has. So uh, if they are an AM student, they would be transported to BOCES on an AM run. If they're a PM student, they'll be on a PM run. If they're a full day, uh, then they would be uh, transported in, in a full day. I don't anticipate major changes uh, to the transportation schedule for BOCES students. Again, having said that, we also have to work with, with BOCES in terms of what their schedule looks like. But I, if, if uh, your student at any level uh, has been in a BOCES program, uh, then they, they uh, will, will still be uh, able to be in that program. So I just wanna address a few more uh, items and then uh, go back to, so, uh, somebody, whoever's the host, needs to make me uh, the host again so I can share. I believe Mr. Beatty was the last host. So I can share my screen again. All right, thank you very much. So, uh, so one of the questions, of course, is uh, that people have been asking, so what about contact tracing? So how does that work? Uh, so uh, we're really fortunate in Broome County to have a, a very close partnership with the Broome County Department of Health. Uh, again, Rachel Hamlin is our district li liaison. Every district uh, has been assigned a liaison. Uh, we are having regular contact with, with the Department of Health. So contact tracing is really, uh, so what happens if there's a positive case? Uh, how do we uh, determine who's been in contact? Now, if it were uh, an adult, uh, then they ask the question, who are you in contact with? 
Uh, when it comes though to a kindergarten student, for example, that's more challenging for that student. So uh, in partnership with the Broome County Department of Health, uh, the district would assist them in doing that contact tracing. So uh, who was in close contact with them, so uh, within six feet, uh, even with a mask for 10 or more minutes, or who was in proximate contact. So were they on the same bus? Were they in the same classroom? As a result of that, we one of the things that we will be doing is uh, keeping very uh, tight attendance records, uh, seating charts. Again, those uh, uh, becomes really important that we're able to know where uh, students and staff are at all times. So uh, you can look uh, on our website. So Mr. Beatty uh, mentioned on our website, there are a host of resources, including a summary of our contact tracing, as well as uh, detailed frequently asked questions uh, from the health department with that. And again, we'll be asking parents to assist us with this as well. This is a, a community effort uh, that as we uh, try to make sure that, that our students uh, remain safe and healthy. One of the questions uh, that has been asked is regarding testing. Uh, will we be conducting testing? Uh, part of that is because the governor has, in his statements, talked about testing, but in the guidance from both state agencies, the New York State Education Department and the Department of Health, uh, the school district is not involved in testing. So testing is done through healthcare providers or at the direction of the Broome County Department of Health. So again, we would be partnering with them uh, if there are, is the need for uh, people to be tested. And again, they're on our website. Uh, there are resources uh, that you can uh, see with that. So then what happens if there's a positive case? So this is where that contact tracing really comes, uh, comes into play. So again, uh, you can see on our website, and I'll, I'll click there, uh, a, a number of things, frequently asked questions, et cetera, uh, where you can look at uh, exactly uh, what would happen. But in that case, uh, if there were a positive case, so uh, we would uh, leave uh, the space that the, the student or staff member was in vacant for 24 hours. That uh, would be uh, deeply cleaned at that time, re-sanitized, et cetera. And then we would be working with the health department in terms of doing that contact tracing so they could make determinations as to who needs to be in isolation or who needs to be quarantined. So one of the things that becomes important is the school district does not make determinations of quarantine. So quarantining is a mandatory quarantine uh, placed by uh, the Broome County Department of Health. One of the things that's noteworthy um, is that the person in isolation, the person who's positive is in isolation for 10 days. Anyone who's in contact with them uh, have to be quarantined for 14 days. So in fact, 14 days from the last time that they were contacted while they were in isolation. So uh, if a child is positive, they have siblings at home, that 14 days starts when they stop having contact with the, the, the person in isolation. So it's feasible uh, that if they're still maintaining daily contact, the person who's positive could be back in school 14 days before uh, they're the, the, just the people who are in contact with them. Again, uh, that's something that will be determined by the, the Department of Health. They will let us know, and we, uh, again, are in close contact with them uh, if there are any uh, students or staff members that need to be in either isolation uh, or in, uh, in uh, quarantine. So uh, we've answered a whole lot of the questions and answers, uh, but uh, looking at some of the other things. Uh, so one of the questions, and, and I will ask Rachel if she has uh, anything to, to offer with this, but one of the questions that I get often is, all right, so how are we gonna make determinations between common cold, flu season, and uh, you know COVID symptoms? So uh, first of all, there are that, that's part of that screening piece. It's not just the temperature. There are those other questions uh, with that screening, but it is not discretionary on our part. So anyone with over 100, uh, a temperature of over 100 degrees must go home. Then that's for the further screening. So, um, you know, 
do they have to go to the doctor uh, after that? I don't, Rachel, do you wanna, uh, wanna comment on, so if somebody gets sent home, then what happens? Um, yeah, so what we've been really recommending in cases like these is to take advantage of the virtual walk-ins or the virtual visits with your doctor. Um, if you can't go in person, um, they're really there to make that best determination if it would be necessary for them to go through with COVID testing and sort of prescribe that test, or if they can determine if it's caused by something else such as, such as allergies or just a cold. Um, it's really just um, hard to tell. So that's why you really look for that um, doctor's notification to see which way it goes there. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and I'll give you, a, a, as we're going through these, and I'll give you another, if there's anything else that you wanna be sure that we talk about. Can you choose all remote and still participate in BOCES programming? Uh, yes, so you could do a remote setting uh, in, in our school um, and a uh, non-remote in the, uh, you know, for, for BOCES, in-person in for BOCES. Uh, so still working on the high school schedule, not sure whether there will be an advisory period, but there absolutely will be opportunities for extra help. Uh, so we, of course, will uh, make sure that uh, students get extra help uh, for them. So uh, parent drop off of medication, so that can happen. Having said that, I will tell you we are uh, limiting visitors as much as we possibly can, of course. Again, trying to, to limit exposure, uh, so we'll be limiting that. So certainly that's something that we can um, get to our, uh, you know, that question for our nurses and, and we can uh, get to that piece as well. Uh, Again, uh, we're, we will be reducing congregating in the halls uh, prior to, to the start of uh, the, the first period in both middle and high school, working on those traffic patterns. So again, we're trying to maintain that social distancing and limit any of that, that congregating. Uh, sports, uh, we don't know is the short answer currently. So that's not governed by uh, the district. Uh, I will tell you uh, one of the things that I hear often is why did I cancel sports? Uh, I have not. Um, then uh, the question becomes, uh, will it be permitted by the state? So New York State Public High School Athletic Association has postponed the fall season until September 21st. The governor in his briefing today announced that he would be uh, giving additional guidance uh, for uh, athletics. Uh, for uh, sometime next week. Uh, we will be having uh, orientations and uh, the orientations will be uh, held remotely. So you can uh, look at, uh, look for information if you have not already received a letter, we'll be looking for correspondence from, from the buildings. Uh, again, uh, very soon with those, those letters, uh, which group they're in, uh, with that piece, some of the questions. So, uh, will the whole class have to be quarantined? So, uh, that will be dependent on uh, what the health department determines, uh, who is in either close or proximate contact. Uh, then we would uh, be looking at that. Uh, Rachel, if you can take a look. So, one of the questions uh, is, so are they, re is a student required to have a doctor's release to come back to school if they have uh, had the over 100 degree temperature uh, and sent home? Is that a requirement? Um, that is something we are still working with, um, discussing with our group of doctors and nurses at the health department. The New York State, um, says it is a um, mandatory practice if the child is sent home sick, that they need that doctor's note of clearance or a negative test and um, the symptoms resolution um, before returning to school. We're working with our doctors now to determine if that's feasible for all the school districts to mandate that. Um, so I don't have a definite answer for you, but I will get back to you. Great, thank you. Well. We'll, uh, we'll make sure we clarify that as, uh, as we move forward. Uh, 
What about uh, participation in co-curricular events? So uh, if someone uh, opts for, uh, for full remote, will they be able to participate in graduation? Yes. Uh, and prom, if there is one, yes. If, again, uh, we were not able to uh, do that ourselves this time, th this past year, um, we'll see what, what happens with that. Can students uh, opt for remote or in person and change their mind? Yes. So this becomes, again, part of that partnership conversation. So uh, most districts in the region, in fact, I'm not aware of another district that uh, has a, a policy uh, or, or plan as we do. In most districts, you have to opt for either 10 weeks, 20 weeks. Uh, I have heard some are even for the full year. So uh, in our plan, it really is something that you can make an adjustment. You can say, you know, uh, we tried in person, we're now more comfortable going remote, or, you know, we want to wait and see how the remote's going and, and then uh, go to in person. So we're absolutely going to uh, try to accommodate those requests. What we would ask, though, is that uh, families work with us. So as you can see, there's some complexity to these plans. Uh, the scheduling has been challenging. The bus routes are challenging. All of these things are, uh, you know, frankly, pretty hard to do. That's uh, the, the group that's here has been spending uh, all day, every day for months working on, on trying to, to pull this off. So if I were to decide to decide here on a Wednesday night, hey, I want my child to, to switch from remote to in-person tomorrow, we probably can't accommodate that. Next week, yeah, we probably can. So we just ask you to work with uh, with our, our teachers, work with our administrators. Uh, we have the, the same interests in mind uh, as you do in the success of your, your, your children. And so we would just ask that uh, people work with us. Um, uh, let's see, trying to think of, uh, is there a checklist uh, uh, for, uh, there is a checklist. Again, you'll be getting uh, some of those things. Uh, if a child is sent home uh, for non-COVID symptoms, would they need a clearance to return? No, uh, but uh, unless there's something, again, that temperature piece uh, is something that uh, we'll, we'll get more uh, information about. Uh, the school start and stop time. Uh, so the uh, the schedules uh, again uh, middle school and high school will start when they always have so student arrival 745 uh, at the middle school 750 uh, at the high school uh, then they will leave uh, really an hour early uh, at the elementary level uh, then we will uh, will work through the the 845 to 330 is uh, for those that are dropped off and then depending upon uh, when, the, when the runs are there. Will there be uh, supply lists coming out? Yes, uh, there will be supply lists uh, coming if there have not been already. Uh, music classes, so our music teachers have been hard at work uh, on music. So that is uh, again, a little bit tricky because there the social distancing is now not six feet, it's 12 feet. So the short answer is we won't have very large ensemble groups. Uh, the, you know, for one thing, our numbers uh, based on that AB schedule and so on are reduced to begin with, but the focus will be on small group and, uh, and individuals. Uh, what we're very fortunate, and we, at this time, we also won't have concerts. Uh, so uh, it wouldn't make sense to, to, we're not planning for that fall concert. However, we're very fortunate uh, to have our beautiful recording studio uh, in our high school. And so we'll be looking at opportunities uh, for students to record. Uh, again, Mr. Morano, Mr. Carl, uh, and uh, we're working on the idea of how can they, they spread students out? Can they go outside when weather permits, et cetera? So uh, as you know, music, our music program is something we take great pride in. Uh, and we, we certainly want to uh, make sure that that uh, that that can happen. Uh, so students, yep, they'll, they will carry uh, their materials with them. We are trying to limit uh, the materials as well, uh, if we can. What's the deadline to, to choose uh, remote or in person? The deadline is last Friday, <laughs> but again, we continue to work with, with folks. What I would ask is, 
Uh, so these are not conceptual plans. They are student by student, uh, really individualized. So uh, as we're looking at staffing levels, as we're looking at teacher assignments, all of those things, uh, the, the, the sooner we know, the better we're able to plan. So uh, the, the hard deadline is not as hard, but we really would ask uh, for you to help us uh, as, as, soon as, uh, as soon as they can. Um, well, parents of seniors get a timeline of information for photos, yearbook, yep, all of that will happen. By the way, we're still uh, waiting for our yearbooks from last year, uh, still in, in production as we uh, start looking at, at those things. Again, so will you get called uh, to uh, pick up your child if they have a high temp? Yes. Um, and I think it's on my screen that, that I've uh, got most of them. So. Uh, again, I want to uh, encourage you, this is just one part of the conversation. Uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to pick up the phone, to send an email. We will, uh, we will post this uh, recording as well as the slides on our website. I certainly uh, want to, to answer questions that you have. Gonna want to thank everyone for the partnership. One, one of the things, uh, as I mentioned, this team has worked incredibly hard. I'm really proud of the work that's been done, uh, keeping kids first. Uh, really proud of our staff, uh, trying to think through how can we ensure uh, that all students are successful. And you know, the other thing to, to know is that the majority of the, the people uh, that are, are as panelists here, we're also parents in the district. So we have those same interests. We also work in the building. So in terms of the health and safety of your kids and our kids and ourselves, it's something obviously that we're taking very seriously and uh, nothing that we're taking for granted. So we appreciate the partnership. Uh, I say often how blessed I am to work in, in the, the, this community, the support that we have, and uh, we know that uh, together we're gonna be able to pull this off. And that's going to require that we do it truly as a partnership. It's not something that we can do alone, certainly without parents. Can't do it uh, without the support of uh, the Broome County Health Department and, and other partners. Uh, just give one uh, last opportunity, Rachel, anything from the, the health department standpoint that we've missed uh, or that you want to uh, provide additional information? Um, no, I think you covered everything. Um, you've got everything included in here that I could think of, so yeah, I'm all set. Great, thank you. Want to again thank everyone for their time this evening and uh, wish you a, a great evening, great rest of the week, and uh, we will we will see you soon. Thank you all so much.